All right now, in Luke chapter 16, we've got this famous story. I don't even want to call it a parable because I don't believe it's a parable. I believe this is a real story that happened about the rich man and the beggar, Lazarus. And this morning, what we're going to be preaching about is the reality of hell. Hell is a real place. I was out soul winning recently, um, maybe about a week or a week and a half ago, and I, and I spoke to a young, a young man. He was a Jehovah's false witness, and he believed. I, I already know what they believe about annihilation and everything else, but he was trying to tell me, he's like, well, loving God wouldn't send people to hell. That was his argument to me. I said, you don't know God. I said, yes, God is loving, but God also has wrath. God also has hate. There are things about God that he's not only just love. God also is a God of wrath. You have to understand who God is. And I explained to him, too. I said, look, do you read your Bible? Because the, the God of the Bible, this God, the God of this book, the God of the Bible, the Bible you claim to believe, and I mentioned, you know, how when he commanded the children of Israel to go inherit the land, how one of the things that they needed to do was to wipe out the inhabitants of the land, of that land, because God was bringing judgment upon them for all of their wickedness and their wicked sin. They left no one alive. They weren't supposed to. Men, women, children, everyone was supposed to be annihilated. Now look, that's not a pleasant thought. That's not something that you think about, oh, wow, that, you know, like, like a lot of people, they won't realize that God's like that at all. They'll say, like, no way God is like that. Yes, he is. We need to understand who God is. God created hell for a reason. Okay? We, we, can't, we, we can't get so focused on the positive attributes of God that we forget about and don't think about the negative aspects of stuff, the, 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 the hell. Okay, the hellfire and the brimstone. Yes, we preach hellfire and brimstone here because it's important because it's part of who God is and it's, and it's spoken of in the Bible quite a bit and we need to warn people about this place. And that's what I was trying to do with that man. I, got, I gave him a little bit of the gospel. I was trying to give him the good news. But look, if you don't realize that you need to be saved from a hell, what do you need a savior for? Amen. And... Um, we're going to go through I've got we're going to go through a lot of the descriptions of hell from the Bible and we're starting off with this with this passage because it's a real place it's not a metaphor Hell isn't a metaphor. It's not just some separation from God where, oh, well, the really bad people go here and they just go and they do whatever they want and they, they're murderers and thieves and everything else and who would want to be around those people? That's not what hell's like. It's not just a place of no rules and no God to rule over them. Actually, it's, it's complete opposite. It's a place where people are being tortured and tormented and engulfed in flames. And the, the, the anger, the source of all of that anger is coming from God. God is the one who created hell. God is actually in hell. We'll see that because God is everywhere. And um, we'll get to that point a little bit later about... about um, you know, the separation from God. You may be separated from His love, yes, but you're not completely separated. It's not like you're just, just God isn't there because He is. But um, let's, let's go through this story a little bit. We're going to see a little bit of this, um, some descriptions of hell because this, this rich man goes to hell. And basically what we see happen, starting in verse 19, I'm not going to read all of this, but there's a rich man that says he fared sumptuously every day. He had really good food. He ate well. He was living a very comfortable life. He had everything going for him. And he was clothed in purple, fine linen, you know, purple and, and fine linen. The Bible, he was, he was rich. Okay, he had, he had, he had want of nothing. And then it tells us about this beggar named Lazarus, and it gives us his name. One of the reasons why I don't believe this is just a parable is because he gives us the name of a man. His name is Lazarus. Not only would he see Lazarus' name, but then he goes to Abraham's bosom. Abraham is a real person. We know Abraham was real. We get this man's name, and none of the parables do we receive the name of a person when Jesus is talking about, you know, um, a, a rule, you know, a king that goes off into another country, and he tells us. And the Bible is usually very, very clear about saying this is a parable. This is a parable. Explain the parable, and he spake a parable unto them. 
That's not found in this language at all. We get a man's name, and, um, and in nowhere does it say anything about a parable. And it says here that, um, you know, Lazarus was a beggar. He is full of sores. He laid at this guy's gate, and he's, all he's asking for is just, look, I just want the crumbs off of your table. I know you're eating well and everything else. Can you please just, just, just wipe off your table and give me the crumbs that I may eat? Right? And um, he says in verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So this guy is not in a good situation at all. He's begging for food. He's begging for bread. He's got sores all over his body. And to top it off, the dogs are just coming and licking at his sores. Miserable. I mean, that's, that's a, that, is a, that is a very, very hard life to live. But we see that that man was saved. Because when he dies, the, the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom. And I don't believe Abraham's bosom is just some place in the center of the earth. The Bible doesn't teach that at all, but I'm not going to get into that on this sermon. This guy goes to heaven. Okay, he goes to be with Abraham. And it says the rich man also died and was buried. And we see this, the rich man died, he was buried, and then it says, and in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. The moment that we die, there's one of two places that we're going to go. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. There is no intermediate place. There is no purgatory. There is no soul sleep. We see directly from this story that when the, when the beggar died, hey, he got carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. When the rich man died, it just says instantly, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Right away, he's just, he breathes his last breath, he dies, and then all of a sudden, the next thing he knows, he's in hell. And we're going to see this description of hell. The first thing it says, being in torments. Torment is, is, is torture. You're, you're being in a place of, where you're being tormented. It's not a, not a pleasant place at all. It says, It seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in, in his bosom. And he cried and said, verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Again, those people want to say that hell is just some metaphor. Oh, that's just, that's just metaphor. Please look. He wants a, a, just one drop of water on his tongue because he's being tormented in a flame. That's what hell is. And, and we see all throughout, we're going to go through plenty of scripture that describes this. It's a ridiculous concept to say that, oh, no, 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 that's all just, that's all figurative language. No, it's not. Hell is a real place, real fire, real brimstone, real torture. People are screaming and wailing, and it's darkness, and it's a horrible place, which is the reason why we go out and win souls. All he wants is just a drop of water, just like the beggar. Remember, the beggar wanted just crumbs off of his table. Now he's asking to send Lazarus. Think about Lazarus. When he knew Lazarus, he was covered with sores. The dogs are licking him in a very poor state. He wants Lazarus to dip his finger and give him, and give him some of that water. Think about that. That's how bad he wants the water. Can you imagine seeing a bum on the street? I mean, I'm not saying that Lazarus is necessarily a bum. I don't know. I mean, but, but some homeless person, okay? Let's just say you see a homeless person in the same condition Lazarus was in. How much would you want him to dip his finger in some water and put that in your mouth? Probably not that much. But when you're in this place, when you're in torments, when you're in hell, when you're engulfed by flames, all you want is that drop of water. But hey, thanks to be to God, if you're saved, Jesus said, you shall never thirst. You shall never be hungry. You shall never thirst, which is, you know, another reason why we know we won't ever experience the flames of hell as this man, all he wanted was that drop of water. Now, we also don't see from this story, we don't know that this man was being particularly bad to Lazarus, that he wasn't giving him the, you know, it doesn't say anything about this man's character, about if he was helpful, if he was doing anything nice to, to, to Lazarus. But we know that he wasn't saved because he went to hell. And that's the other thing is, is it's kind of notable here. And you oftentimes people just think, oh, the really bad, well, hell, that really bad place of torture and torment and everything else is only for really bad people. 
It's only for people who are murderers and pedophiles and everything else. Look, is hell for them? Absolutely. This man could have been inviting Lazarus to sit at him with, with dinner. And if he didn't have his faith in Jesus Christ, he would still end up in the same place. We don't see him abusing Lazarus in any way. Yet he still went to hell. Hell is a place for every single unbeliever. Anybody who doesn't put their, their faith in Jesus Christ. It's a place of torment. Let's keep reading here. It says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. One more little piece to keep in mind, that even though there may be, maybe this was a wicked man, maybe he was like the, you know, some of the movie stars and the, you know, the, the, the people that, that have this wealth and fame and they live these extremely wicked, horrible lifestyles and they're just completely against God. You might look at them and be like, well, that's not fair. How come they get all this great stuff? Why is God allowing them to get all this stuff? Why aren't they going through all this, you know, suffering like a good man like Lazarus is doing? You know, he's a son of God. He's a child of God, yet he's begging and, and he's full of sores and everything else. Well, look at what happens in the end. Would you want to trade places with, with that rich man? No way. And we need to remember this, that when it looks like the wicked are get away, getting away with things, when it looks like, oh, they've got it all, they've got the money, they've got the fame, they've got, a, they've got everything, don't be desirous of, of, their, of their riches because most of them, this is going to be their end. And all of them, if they don't have their faith in Christ, obviously, but, but when you see that, when you see someone who's wicked and they're not getting punished, that's because they're not a son of God. They're not being chastised by the Father. They're getting away with that stuff, but they're not really going to get away with it because they're going to burn and suffer and be tortured and tormented in flames forever and ever and ever. It never ends. Let's keep reading here. I'll, it says, And beside all this, in verse 26, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence... To you cannot, uh, verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So just to recap here, just because we're trying to get a description of hell. I know I'm, I'm jumping off into a few other related topics, but um, verse 23, it says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Verse 24, right at the end, for I am tormented in this flame. And verse 28 at the end, lest they also come into this place of torment. Is hell a place of torment? Absolutely. No doubt about it. No question about it. It's been referred to multiple times. Hell is not a place where you just get annihilated and then you just cease to exist. Hell is a real place and it's a place of torture and torment. It's a place where you're going to be experiencing pain. You may not have your physical body, but you can, you're still going to be able to feel that pain. And so he asks, and you've got you to imagine that everybody who's in hell today, what they've got to be thinking about their loved ones. Because he's obviously conscious. He has a memory. He knows what's going on. He recognizes Lazarus. He didn't forget his entire life on this earth. To the contrary, he's still thinking about his family. He's thinking about his brethren. How miserable of a place is that to be? Not only are you being suffered, you know, you're suffering and being tortured and tormented, but now you got to think, hey, this is real. I didn't believe this when I was on the earth. What about my children? What about my brothers? What about my parents? They're going to come to this place. And if you have any love at all in your heart for those people that you've known in your life, to be stuck in that place and to know like maybe you maybe you and them would would just go back and forth about how stupid these these Christians are and how dumb they are and you'd get a, get, get a big kick out of it and laugh about it and now you're stuck in hell being tortured and tormented you know it's real and you're helpless there's nothing you can do about your family and friends all you can do is just wait to see them and just hope that someone else can bring them the gospel that is a miserable place to be because that's all you know for the rest of eternity is going to be pain and torture and torment. And you still know that there's people out there that are going to be coming to that place and you can't do anything about it, which is all the more reason why our time on this earth is so important. We have time to do something about that. 
There are people dying and going to hell every single day. Every single day, every, however often people die. I mean, I don't know if it's every second, every minute, whatever the stats are on that. People are continually going to hell. And we need to make the best use of this time that we have. And the answer that Abraham gave unto him is real interesting because he says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, he's trying to argue with him. He said, no, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. They'll believe. If they saw Lazarus, he's saying, if they see Lazarus, they'll repent, they'll believe, and they'll avoid this place. And, and Abraham answered him. He says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. And isn't that the truth? Today we know Jesus Christ came and he rose from the dead. This was Jesus speaking. Jesus giving this story, recounting this story that happened. And Jesus Christ came and he rose from the dead. Yet there's still people today that don't repent. And um, very important. Let's, let's move on to our next, our next place. Go, if you would, to Mark chapter number 9. You're in Luke. Just flip back to Mark chapter number 9. I'm going to try to jump through some of these attributes of hell because we need to get a good picture of hell. Now, most people today have a pretty good picture of what hell is like anyways. It's not something that you need to really spend a whole lot of time explaining to people, but we need to make sure that, that hell is not just some figurative place. It's not just, just something you read in a book. It's, yeah, you understand the concept, but let that reality sink home. The reality of people burning. It's a real place. And, and we have to stop every once in a while and think about that and to, to help, at the very least, give us the motivation to love other people and to preach the gospel unto them. Psalm 116 verse 3 says, The sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Talking about the pains of hell. Hell is a place where you experience pain. Mark 9, look down at verse number 43. It says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. That fire of hell is never going to go out. There is no hope for people that go to hell. That fire is never going to die. It is going to continue forever and ever and ever. So it never shall be quenched. Verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Here we get another aspect of hell. You know, you think about when somebody dies physically in this life and they get buried in the ground, what happens? You know, a lot of people have, you know, say so become worm food, right? It, because the worms and the, and the critters that are in the ground, after a while, when you're in that ground, they're going to come and they're going to they're gonna decompose your body. They're going to eat you up and, and you're going to return back into the earth essentially but when you when someone's in hell someone's soul is in hell it says their worm dieth not which makes me think you are going to be riddled with worms people in, in hell are riddled with these worms but you aren't consumed the same way that when you burn something in a fire it gets consumed and it turns the ashes and it's gone well in hell you never consume your soul doesn't just burn up to the point where it doesn't exist anymore you're still there. It's, it's, it's a fire that, that doesn't consume you the same way that, that these worms don't consume your soul in hell. Yet they're still there causing even more torment for you because you're dead. Their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. He lists this three times. Keep reading verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now what's he saying in all this? He's trying to express how horrible hell is. Look, if it means plucking out your own eyeball, if you have to cut off your leg, if you have to cut off your arm, whatever you have to do to avoid this place, look, anything is better than going to hell. This is the point that he's trying to drive home with these examples, that if your eye offended, hey, pluck it out. Look, if that's what's going to 
keep you from getting saved or if that's what's, you know, pluck it out. It's way better to experience that type of pain on this earth, to, to go without those things, than it is to spend an eternity in hell because hell is such a horrible place. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse number 40, the Bible reads, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's referring to hell as a furnace of fire. Again, you can't escape the fiery description of hell. It's, it, it, if it was just a metaphor, he'd probably be using other examples. But no, it's fire. It's real. It's in the center of this earth. It's in the heart of the earth. He says there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. People are going to be screaming. Again, another aspect of hell that is, that is so unpleasant, that, that is just so horrible. I think of, when I think of just screaming in general, I could think of, um, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night when a little infant, a little baby wakes up and they're screaming their head off and you're really exhausted and tired. Man, that can just pierce your ears and just, and just you know, it, it's, not, it's not very pleasant to just be woken up with all this screaming. But that's nothing compared to the screaming and wailing that's going on in hell. Because that screaming is one thing. Now, what's even worse than the screaming just in the middle of the night is to hear, for example, your child get hurt really, or, or your loved one, anybody, get hurt really bad and start screaming out that way because they're in so much pain. Add to that, you're not getting any rest. You're not getting any sleep because you're engulfed in flames. You're not able to rest. You're not able to sleep at all. All your life exists of at that point, your death exists of because you're not even alive, is screaming. Torture, pain, horrible place. Look, I don't like this topic, okay? I don't like hell. I don't like thinking about it, but we have to think about it because it's real. This is the place. Look, when you, when you look at someone on the street, you have to understand this place that we're describing this morning, that person might end up in that place. Think about that. When you look people in the eye, is this person going to end up screaming their head off for the rest of their death in hell forever, being tortured and tormented. The goal of this sermon is to try to help us to be motivated to want to reach the lost because hell is such a bad place. And to never forget, one, we deserve that place. To keep us humble. But God saved us from that place by offering us a free gift. We need to bring that gift to others. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14. See, a lot of people have this misconception that, that Satan rules in hell. That, oh, that's Satan's dominion and that's his place and that's where he comes to rule and he reigns in hell. He does not rule and reign in hell. The Bible says in Psalm 139 verse 7, he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God is in hell. As much as he's in heaven, as much as he's everywhere. God is omnipresent, which means he exists everywhere. Nothing can contain God. He's all over the place. But he says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You don't escape God from going to hell. You don't fall into Satan's dominion. But we're going to see this here in Revelation chapter 14. Um, look at verse number 9. It says, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? It's Jesus Christ. 
It says, Jesus Christ, you are going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ while you're being tormented and tortured with fire and brimstone. You're not escaping Jesus Christ by going to hell. Hey, you want to try to get away from Jesus? You want to try to get away from God in this lifetime? Yeah, good luck with that because when you're burning in hell, you're going to be in his presence at all times. You cannot get away from him. Verse 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. There you see exactly what I was saying. They don't have rest. Day and night, no rest at all. They're sleep deprived. They're, you know, it's, it's, this, it's, it's a horrible place. It's a horrible place. And this was when I mentioned earlier, I was talking to the, to the, man, the young man who, who didn't believe how it was real, how a loving God's in there. He believed it was real that it existed, but he thought it was only for like the devil and for the devils and that's where they were going to go. And I showed him this verse. I showed Re Revelation 14 because verse 9 says, if any man worship the beast. This is talking about people receiving the mark of the beast. These are men. These are men that are going to be tormented and tortured in his flame. You can't get around this. He had nothing to say to that. He still didn't want to believe it because he'd been taught a certain way or because it's too horrible to think of or whatever. But you can't argue with what the scripture says. It says that any man, men die and go to hell. It's a, it's a fact. It happens. Flip over, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And we'll see in verse 10 that the devil is not ruling and reigning in hell, as I just mentioned. Revelation 20, 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So if the devil is being tortured and tormented day and night forever and ever, does it sound like he's ruling and reigning? I don't think so. The devil is going to be tortured and tormented just like everyone else and probably even worse than anybody else. The Bible refers to different levels of hell. I believe Satan is going to be in the lowest hell. There are those, and we're going to get into this tonight. So this morning's sermon is about hell. Tonight's sermon is going to be about heaven. So um, it's complete opposites. We're going, to, we're going to get the full description of hell this morning and a full description of heaven this evening. But just as there's different levels of heaven, there's different levels of hell. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 32, 22, the Bible says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. This is only one reference. I didn't want to bring all of them up today just for sake of time. This is such a, a, a big topic to cover. The Bible talks about people receiving the greater damnation, right? It talks about Judas, he that delivered me unto thee hath the great, you know, committed the greater sin. He had the greater damnation. He's going to be punished even more. So even though Pilate, you know, wasn't saved and he's going to get punished because he delivered Jesus up to death, well, Judas had the greater transgression. He had the greater sin. He's going to be punished even more. And I believe the devil, I don't know, I don't think anybody's going to be punished as much as the devil. But um, the same way in this life, we could, we could, we could earn rewards for ourselves to have in heaven and, and kind of get more things. Well, the more wicked of a life that you live, the worse hell is going to be for you. Now, obviously, you don't want to be in any part of hell, any level of hell. But to think that after everything we've just described, that, that it could be even worse, it could be even hotter, it could be even, even worse for some people. The lowest hell. The Bible says that hell is a place of sorrow. In 2 Samuel 22, 6, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Now, I want to just mention this. The Bible refers to hell, and when we talk about hell, hell is, is in the center of the earth right now. That's where hell is. We saw already in Revelation 20, um, hell is going to be relocated to the lake of fire. And when we read these different descriptions of hell, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 8, you'll see, I'll just show you this for yourself. Um, 
it's not really any different. Okay, the lake of fire is just the new location for hell. Hell gets relocated when, when um, this heaven and earth pass away. Because it's going to happen. The heaven and earth, earth is going to pass away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth isn't going to have hell at its core. Right now, hell is right beneath our feet going down to the center of the earth. Hell is going to be relocated at that point to this lake of fire. And this lake of fire is in outer darkness. So when we see some of these descriptions, you're in Matthew chapter 8. People, it's still an everlasting punishment. People in hell are going to remain in hell. Even when they're in the lake of fire, they're still in hell because they're still just relocated. Hell's relocated to this lake of fire, if that makes sense. You know, people like to say, oh, well, hell doesn't last forever because you're in hell and then you go to the lake of fire. Well, no, hell does still last forever. It's, it's kind of a stupid argument. People want to, want to try to nitpick at these, at these terms. But hell still is going to exist forever. It's still eternal burning and torture. Look, the flame is not quenched. The fire never goes out in hell. And just because hell's relocated to this lake of fire, look, you're essentially talking about the same thing. You're talking about the lake of fire. You're talking about hell. We go over this all the time when we go out souling with people because we'll show them Revelation chapter 20 where it refers to the second death as, as the lake of fire. The lake of fire is referred to as the second death. So we'll... Um, well, basically, I mean, to give people a common understanding, that's talking about hell. And it is. Because hell gets relocated to that lake of fire. And, and it's not that anyone isn't still going to be in hell at that place. Um, but Matthew chapter 8, look at verse number 11. It says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when he's talking about outer darkness, he's talking about that lake of fire, that outer place. And I'm going to get into the new Jerusalem tonight in a sermon on heaven. But um, that is just... Outer darkness is away from everything. It's not going to be, you know, necessarily like near um, the place where we're going to be, the new heaven and new earth. But um, that's going to be cast out into outer darkness. And also Matthew 22, 13 says, Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's weeping, crying, there's crying, screaming, you know, horrible place. Hell is also a punishment for sin, obviously. Um, Psalm 9.16 says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Haggai and Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Hell is a place of condemnation. Are you still in Matthew? Did I have you in Matthew? Turn, if you would, to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Jesus Christ goes on this tirade against the Pharisees and the scribes and he's just laying into them about their hypocrisy. We're saying, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. That's Matthew 23. We're going to look at a few of the things that he says in Matthew 23 to these, to these Pharisees, to these reprobates, to these false prophets. Matthew 23, look at verse number 15, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. A proselyte is like a convert. Okay, it's a, it's a follower. So they're, they're, they're making converts unto their false religion, unto their dead religion, their works-based religion. It says, And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves because hell is their destination and they're saying look when you make a convert you're converting them to become children of Satan now they're children of hell just like yourselves and then even more so then jump down to verse 33 he says in Matthew 23 33 ye serpents ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell hell is a damnation it's where you're, you're, you're damned to hell. It's a condemnation as well. Um, you know, that's why the Bible says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hell is a damnation. It's a condemnation. It's, it's, it's a, the, the place where you're going to receive for the things that you've done if you're not saved, the things you've done in this world. You're going to receive a, re a full recompense 
for all of the evil that you've done in your life. Now, I don't think I'm going to get into this very much. I want to read some of this for you. This is a topic that I've already preached on in the past about Jesus going to hell. Jesus went to hell to, to pay for our sins. In um, Acts chapter 2 is one of, the, one of the best places I like to show this. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. We're going to see this. I'm going to give you a few scriptures real briefly. I'm going to try to, to rip through this real quick because um, I'm almost done here, but I, wanna, I don't want to... I could spend an entire hour on the subject of Jesus going to hell, and which makes perfect sense when you realize that He paid for our sins. He died for our sins. Well, the punishment for our sins is to go to hell. Of course, Jesus went to hell to pay for that. You're in Acts chapter 2. I'll read for you from Revelation 1.18. Revelation 1.18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Why does Jesus have the keys of hell and death? Because he went there. Jesus says, I was dead. Now, when the Bible refers to, we talked about this in our study in John, that when the Bible talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he says, God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never died. Their bodies physically passed away, but they're alive because they had everlasting life. You and I, if you're saved this morning, you have everlasting life. You will never die. Never. You will never be considered dead because you have everlasting life. Well, Jesus Christ says, I am he that liveth and was dead. The reason why he was dead is because he literally was dead. He was dead in hell paying for our sins for three days and three nights. Verse, um, stay there in, in Acts chapter 2. I'll read from you Matthew 13, verse 39 says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, talking about the story of Jonah, and the whale swallowed him up, he was there for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Hell is in the heart of the earth, my friends. Jesus Christ's soul was in hell for those three days and those three nights. Look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verse number 25. One more proof that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. The fiery, literal hell, which is the only place ever described of hell in the Bible. People try to tell you, oh no, the paradise was actually in hell. And Jesus Christ went to paradise, and that was actually the cool place of the center of the earth, not the hot place. Really? Because any time the word hell is used, or the pit, or the, the, the bottomless pit, these places are all talking about hell. It's never, never once is it a positive reference. People are trying to redefine terms and say, oh, well, paradise is, is actually here. No, it's not. Paradise is in heaven. But um, I'm not going to get into that right now. Jesus Christ was in the heart of earth for three days and three nights. He went to hell. The Bible says he went to hell. And let's read here in Acts chapter 2, verse 25. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, if hell was, was, this, was a good place, why would he be saying, I have hope because you won't leave my soul in hell? Like, you're not going to just leave me here. If it's a good place, why would he care about his soul being left in hell? If it's a place of, of paradise and it's such a great place to be, why would he care at all about his soul being left there? But we're going to see, too, he explains that this is talking about Jesus Christ because it is. This is, this is referring to, this is a prophecy, a, a, a prophecy of Jesus Christ that was recorded in the book of Psalms. Verse 28 says, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren. So Peter's going to explain what he's talking about here. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. 
He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. So this this thing that we just read that we just read about about my soul being left in hell is speaking about the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. In black and white, very specific, the soul of Jesus Christ talking about his resurrection, right? Right before he rose again from the dead, where was his soul? In hell. Three days, three nights, his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh see corruption. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, explained and expounded in the New Testament. Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. I'm going to get off that topic. Like I said, I could preach an entire sermon on that. I want to show you something now because I think this is going to hit home. This is one of the reasons that prompted me to preach this sermon. I don't normally use props and stuff in sermons, but I want to show this to you. I was watching this with my family the other day, and it's amazing. And what this is, we're going to see a video. We're going to watch this real short video. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Or is it too um, is it too dark? Is that better? This is a volcano. There's a man here, and he's in this protective outfit. It's this this real protective shield. He was only able to stand there for about a minute. Because it just got too hot to even, even with all this protective gear, the best that this world has to try to protect us from heat. Look at how, you look at the violence of this fire and this flame. This is fire and brimstone, my friends. This comes from hell. This is to give you an idea of what hell is like. It's an amazing thing. And, and, and it really blew me away when I saw this because it's something you hear, but it's hard to visualize. It's hard to get in your mind. It's hard to grasp. This is what hell, this is like the coldest part of hell right here because this comes up to the surface of the earth. This is just a very, 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 very small picture of what it's like. Can you imagine being in the midst of this and not ceasing to exist and experiencing what is going on just with with all this this chaos and and the 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 burning and other people around you that you can hear the screaming and the wailing and that blew me away when we saw that because it really hits home to realize this is all real it's a horrible place to be in hell. I mean, it's, 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 you can't, words cannot describe how bad it is enough. And we have to take the time to think about this because this is the driving factor. I mean, think about your family. Think about your loved ones. Think about your mother or your father and think about that place. Do you want them to spend an eternity in that place? I don't even want him to spend one second in that place. That would just be a horrible way to die, to just, to just fall into that. Let alone to be there forever and ever and ever with no hope, no escape, no getting out. It's a permanent place. Let this sink down in your hearts and in your minds today. Don't forget this sermon. Don't forget about hell in the reality of it. There's so many good things that we have in our life, it's easy to push this out of your mind. This is a motivation. This ought to drive you to say, you know what? I don't care what people think about me when I talk about the Bible because I'm trying to save their soul from hell. It's a very, very scary place. It's not a place that anybody would ever want to go. It is a place to be feared, for sure. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We need to have a proper respect and fear of God. For one, God created that place. 
God deserves our respect and our reverence, even as saved, you know, saved children of God. We ought to have a proper fear of him. The lost need even more of a fear of him because that place is real. The Bible says in Jude 1 20, Jude, well, Jude chapter, verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Look, some people, they need, they need to be afraid of hell in order for them to be saved. Some people, you know, maybe don't respond as well to that, but some people, they need to hear how bad of a place hell is because, so that they do get scared, so that they do get saved. That's why the Bible says pulling them out of the fire because that's where they're headed. Isaiah 38, 17, the last scripture I'll read for you this morning. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. That is the great news that we need to go out and preach to people because we can be delivered from that pit of corruption, from that pit of hell, and God will cast all of our sins behind his back. We deserve that punishment. We deserve that, that fiery torture and torment. But God has, has mercifully loved us and graciously given us a gift to say, okay, here's all your sins, gone. Gone why? Gone because Jesus went to that place for you. He paid the, the price that you deserve to pay. Please, I, I beg you, let this sink in. Let this sink down this morning. Let it be a motivation. Like I said, you know, oftentimes we get so caught up in our own little fears about what's this person going to say or, oh, is this rude or should I bring this up? Hey, is that really important if, if that person dies and goes to hell? About your feelings or their feelings or, or, or whatever? I mean, sure, you could, you could sit around every time you go with your unsaved family and just talk about the weather and talk about the weather and everyone will have a smile on their face and everyone will be getting along just great and then one day they're going to die and they're going to burn in hell forever. Is that what you want for your family? Is that what you want for your friends? Is that what you want for your neighbor? Hell is real, my friends. The Bible talks quite a bit about I didn't go to every reference of hell in the Bible. I was trying to pick out specific ones to get the different attributes to understand the burning, the torment, the darkness, the weeping, the wailing, the gnashing of teeth, all of these different things that the Bible's talking about. The worst part of that is that it's eternal. People have no hope at all. Their fate is sealed and they're there forever. Not a, not a fun sermon this morning. Not something we're going to be walking out of here and cheering about, okay? But that's not the goal. We don't, we don't always, we're not always here to just feel good about ourselves or just to, to be in, in, in a, you know, a great mood all the time. But this is meant to, to provoke you unto doing the good works, unto preaching the gospel. Hey, if you're not very good at it, get better. Study the Bible. Know it more be able to go out and do a good job. Be able to go out and make a difference in people's lives. This is why we're here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for that great gift that you have for us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please, in our busy lives and in all the things that go on, and, and everything that, that happens here, God, help us never to forget this this extremely important reality dear lord help us to have compassion on others help us to look on others and 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 love them and and want them to not experience this type of of torment help us to to understand and and remember that that's real lord help us just use this um these descriptions that you've given us of how bad a place hell is to, to be able to motivate us to speak to our friends, speak to our family, speak to loved ones, and speak to those that we don't even know. Lord, tell them the dangers as if, as if they were in a house that was burning down. Even if, if you're walking down the street and you saw somebody's house was on fire and, 
and you can hear that you know you knew that someone was in there lord i don't know of anybody who wouldn't just yell out at the very least or do whatever they could to try to warn that person that they're about to to die in flames lord help us to to give the same warning it may not be right in front of our eyes that we can see but it's in your word and we know that it's true lord help us to um to just be mindful of that fact and to bring the warning to the lost that they need to, to get saved and to put their faith on Christ in order to avoid such a horrible, horrible existence in hell. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.